Hello and welcome to the Hay Festival Book of the Month for September, The Island of Missing Trees by Elif Shafak. I'm Manveen Rana, I'm a journalist and the host of the daily podcast for The Times and I'll be interviewing Elif tonight. But we do welcome questions from the audience wherever you are throughout the session, so do send them in via the questions tab, which you should be able to see on the screen, and we'll do our best to get through as many of those as possible before the end of the event. Before we begin, um, a quick thank you on behalf of Hay to everyone who's donated to the Festival's Future Fund when registering for this event. You can continue to support the festival by donating on the website and allowing events like this to take place. Now, this month's book, The Island of Missing Trees, is a brilliant and incredibly moving read. If you haven't read it yet, you're in for a treat uh, and you can pick up a copy on the Hay Festival website or from your local bookseller. And I'm delighted tonight to be joined by its author, Elif Shafak, who is an award-winning British-Turkish novelist. Her work has been translated into 54 languages and she is awe-inspiringly prolific, having written 19 books, 12 of which are novels and not a single one a dud. Um, Elif's last novel, 10 Minutes, 38 Seconds in This Strange World, was shortlisted for the Booker Prize and the RSL on Datya Prize and chosen as Blackwell's Book of the Year. She's one of the most interesting and thoughtful people I've ever had the joy to interview, and I'm only sorry that this is a virtual event, because normally there's a moment when you look up and you just sort of see the audience completely mesmerised by her answers. So I'm, just going to, I'm going to imagine you all doing that tonight. Elif, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for every word. You know, it means a lot to me. I'm, I'm so happy we're doing this together. Thank you. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Um, your latest book, I mean, you never shy away from controversy at, at the best of times, but did you have to think twice before taking on a subject like Cyprus? To, to be honest, it was, um, it, it was a story I've been wanting to write for a long, long time. I, I love Cyprus. I feel emotionally attached to the island and it always mesmerized me, both its beauty, but also its complexity, you know? Uh, and there's no doubt this is a beautiful island with beautiful people, north and south. Uh, and yet at the same time, it's a place where the past is very much alive. It's not bygone, you know. Mm. I think it's breathing within this present moment. And there are lots of wounds and hurt and the wounds are unhealed. There's accumulated grief and sorrow. Um, so how do you tell the story of a place that has experienced ethnic violence, partition, division, without yourself falling into the trap of tribalism or nationalism, you know, as a storyteller, how do you find the right angle? And I couldn't for a very long time. So I didn't know how to approach the story. I've been thinking about it, reading about it, but keeping it to myself in a way. Only when I found the voice of the fig tree, only then I found a little bit more courage and the angle that I needed to, to you know, enter into the story. I want to talk to you about the fig tree in just a moment, but I mean, was it was it particularly hard? You talked about sort of the nationalism and, and how difficult it is to find a voice through, um, you know, all of that complex historical baggage. Did you have to be very aware of sort of your own you know, Turkish background? Was it quite hard to write um, for you? Of course. I mean, and I am very much aware of, you know, we all have our own baggage. We all have our own internalized biases, prejudices, and I think we should be aware of them. We should be ready to learn from each other and also understand that whatever we read in history, there's so much that's left out, that's excluded. So we need to be aware of untold stories, untold, you know, the voices that we do not hear, particularly the voices of minorities, but also women. I mean, history, as we know, almost never includes the stories of women, right? Whenever we learn about men, it's about generals, rulers, perhaps politicians in the past, but almost never women. Uh, there's no one is ordinary, you know? So, so I don't like that term, ordinary citizens. The stories of human beings of all backgrounds. Growing up in Turkey, I of course, heard lots of stories about the other side and what they have done, uh, less so about, you know, in a, in a mutual way. You don't, you don't hear it in that way. Also, you never learn about the sorrows and, and um, the hurts that is accumulated across the island, 
or anywhere in the world, actually. I don't think this is only about Cyprus. You know, the themes that I deal with in this book, whether it's memory, remembering, be, trying to build up a better future, all of these are quite universal themes. And I'm hoping anyone who comes from a complex background or from places that have experienced some kind of partition division might relate to this book more strongly. I mean, there's, there are so many universal themes there. Um, and it's one of those books where you end up feeling like you're living their experience with them as well as relating it to your own. I mean, the novel is set in modern day London, but also in Cyprus of the 1970s. Just for people who don't remember the history, could you sort of give us a little refresher of, of, that, of the significance? You know, what was life like for, for Cypriots in the 70s? Yeah, I mean, we should not forget that the island that we're talking about, as we're speaking, there is a partition line there guarded by UN troops. So mm -hmm. Nicosia is the last divided capital in Europe. And the, the border, that partition is quite palpable. It's quite visible. It just cuts through. Um, going back to 1970s, but also before 1950s, 60s, there are different waves of violence which is also part of British history. And that's one thing that puzzles me because even though Cyprus is one of the top destinations for British tourists, and many people, of course, understandably love to go there and enjoy its beauty. Um, and even though it's part of the history of this country, not many people in the UK are familiar with the complexity of the history in Cyprus. So that's a big puzzle to me. And I think we tend to forget very easily and memory matters. So if you were growing up in 1970s, as the characters in this book are, Kostas is Greek Cypriot and, and Daphne is Turkish Cypriot. And if you happen to love each other, you're not gonna have an easy life uh, from each community. So th there are many layers that I wanted to unpack, you know, nationalism on both sides but also colonialism, post-colonialism. I mean, the history of Cyprus is quite complex, but if I may add this very quickly, I also wanted to be able to say wherever, whenever human beings have destroyed each other and wherever we've seen ethnic violence, it's not only human lives that are destroyed, it's also an entire ecosystem. So it's the island of missing trees. You know, we also destroy plants and trees and animals. And as we're destroying ecosystems, we're also destroying our own lives. Well, on that, you know, because you do write beautifully about not only the, the human history, but also about the plants and the trees and the ecosystem. One of the voices narrating this tale is, you know, I think unexpectedly, really enchantingly, a, a fig tree. C could you sort of explain for us, you know, why did you choose to write from the perspective of fig tree and why a fig tree in particular? I think there are a couple of things that brought the idea to me. Uh, one is I, I, I lived in the US for a while. I used to teach at different universities there and I wrote several of my books actually in the US. And when I was in Michigan, at the University of Michigan uh, in Ann Arbor, the winters were quite cold over there and very windy, chilly. I never, I've never forgotten this. I've met some Italian American families who would bury their fig trees under the ground in trenches when the winters were particularly cold and then unbury them come next spring. So this vertical tree becomes horizontal, buried and then unburied when the weather is a bit milder. I remember that and I started doing more research and then you realize actually lots of immigrant families know this, particularly the elderly, the, the first generation, coming from all over the Mediterranean or the Levant. And that theme of burial and unburial was important to me throughout the book. Maybe we'll talk about that. Um, I would love to mention the Committee on Missing Persons. Uh, it's, um, it's a bi-communal organization that is initiated by UN in Cyprus, but it's the Cypriots, it's the islanders who are doing the groundwork, the real work. So Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots are working together. And among them, there are so many young people. Many of them are volunteers. Many of them are women. And they believe in coexistence. And literally what they're doing is digging the ground in order to find the bones of people who have gone missing during the troubles. And there are thousands of them. They're digging not in order to revive all the animosities, but to give the dead a proper burial and the families a sense of closure. 
So it all comes back to this burial and burial. Do we have, sh sh should we talk about the past or should we just try to forget it as fast as we can? I'm always intrigued by this dilemma between memory and collective amnesia. But I think memory is a responsibility if we want to repair what has been broken. And you write so beautifully about the idea of memory, um, you know, whether it's uh, on a personal basis, but also sort of the idea of a collective memory, of, of a cultural memory, which is passed from one generation to another and how, you know, in many ways that can, it can also be quite negative. I mean, t tell us a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, part, maybe it's also because I come from Turkey. And as you know, Turkey is a country with a very long history, complex and rich history. But rich history doesn't mean strong memory. Just mm -hmm. the opposite. I think we're a society of collective amnesia. And the easiest thing to do in Turkey is just to forget the past. So there are all these pockets, you know, void. Um, and that vacuum is being filled by either ultranationalist or Islamist you know, ultra-religious interpretations of the past that says we were a mighty empire, glorious empire, we've never, you know, done everything with it was great. That kind of narrative pervades and it's not a nuanced way of talking about the past. I like calmer talks about the past, both the beauties but also the atrocities of the past we should be able to talk about, to learn, hopefully never ever make the same mistakes but try to understand also the past changes depending on who is telling the story. So who is not telling the story is incredibly important. And therefore we need to have this cognitive flexibility, just try to put ourselves in the shoes of someone whose voice we might have never heard when we talk about history. You know, what is excluded is important to me. I guess all I'm trying to say is as a writer, of course I love stories, but I'm equally drawn to silences. And anyone who feels silenced or pushed to the periphery, marginalized, disempowered, I want to give more voice to people who feel that way. And when you write about memory, I mean, there's also there's almost a weight that it sort of confers from from one generation to another. You know, people are, are almost limited by the memory of of you know generations past. Um, is is that something you 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 felt or wanted to to talk about? That is very true. And actually, this is something that I've also observed on both sides of the Atlantic, for instance. M many immigrant families, I think, experience that intergenerational difference in a way. The older generations, especially in immigrant families where there has been a displacement, but also any family that comes from a more complicated, complex background might relate to this. The first generation, the elderly, are the ones who have experienced the biggest hardships and traumas, but they don't necessarily have the language or an outlet. You know, they don't even know how to talk about these, what they have gone through. So there is a buried story inside them. The second generation, they're so busy adopting, finding their feet, building a new life. You know, they have to be forward-looking, future-oriented. They're not that interested in the past. And then the third or fourth generations who are the youngest in the families, actually they are the ones who are speaking about the past. They are the ones who are asking the biggest questions about identity, their ancestors' stories. And I find it so interesting that you can come across young people with the, carrying the memories of their elderly. And that's something I observe all across the world. I also wanted to explore this notion of inherited pain is it possible to inherit the sorrows or the pain of our ancestors, of our, of our great grandmothers? I mean, we do talk about how we inherit our nose or you know, our, the color of our hair, but we never think, we don't want to talk much about what else we might be inheriting from past generations and their stories. I loved in the book, you describe the, the curse of memory mm -hmm. and in particular how old Cypriot women curse people. Yeah. It's not injuries or bolts of lightning. Yeah, yeah, be yeah. Indeed, because you know, memory can be a burden too. If you if you have a very strong memory, so in the long run, I think what is healthier or, or perhaps lighter is a combination of memory and forgetting. You need to be able to forget also a little bit. But in order to expect people, before we expect people to forget, we have the responsibility to remember. Otherwise, it will feel like adding insult to injury. 
That's why I think memory needs to come first and then we can expect people to forget. Yeah, I was, I was really haunted by the idea. I, th I think you, you said they sort of say, may you never be able to forget, may you go to your grave still remembering, which I'm adopting as a curse now. I can't imagine anything <laughs> worse. Um, quite a big part of the novel is about sort of excavating the past. You know, one of the characters is a, a schoolgirl um, in Britain who knows nothing of her family's past in, in Cyprus. And, you know, it sort of felt like it was in many ways the journey of many people who are second generation immigrants who are trying to understand a world that has fundamentally shaped them, but they've never directly experienced themselves. You know, trying to make sense of, of your own story, I guess. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, I think, you know, of course, in the book, uh, Kostas and Defne, they each come from different ethnic communities. Um, but because they've gone through so many hardships together, and because their child is born and bred in the UK, they think, especially Defne, the mother, thinks by not talking much about the past, she can give a better future, a lighter, you know, existence to her own daughter, because what's the use of talking about the past when the past was so complex and hurtful? So people have different coping mechanisms, but that doesn't mean Ada or Ada, as she might call herself. Ada in Turkish means island, but having been born and bred here, I, I have a feeling she might call herself Ada. Um, <laughs> so for her, even though she doesn't know the stories of her ancestors, she has a feeling that there are things that she hasn't been told. And so she does feel the absences, the silences, and those silences also shape us. They shape our psychology. Um, and, and even though we might not know what exactly lies behind them, we still feel their weight on our shoulders. I think it's a difficult age to be a young person. And when I look at someone like Ada, you know, it's, we're living in a world that doesn't allow us to be multiple let alone celebrate our multitudes. I think as human beings, we all contain multitudes like Walt Whitman used to say. But the problem is the world we're living in does not want to hear that. Instead wants to put us in one box and then you know expects us to stay there once and for all. So if you come from a complex background, if you contain mul multitudes like ev everyone else does, on top of that, there's this existential angst that we carry today I think there's this feeling of being trapped and many people like other, I believe are building up a scream inside. Like there's a scream that we want to unleash, but we don't know how, both individually and collectively. I think people want to scream and people feel voiceless. I, I mean, it's, it's a really visceral moment when, when you know, at one point she, she does just scream and, and all of that sort of pain and, and, and grief sort of, um, find a, a physical manifestation is that I mean is that something you really worry about you talked about the moment we're living in and and the pressures on people in terms of identity is that something you worry about for that generation yeah, I do worry about and not only that generation um, because imagine when we look at our let's say grandparents they have gone through lots of difficulties no doubt historically right but they always retain this belief that if you give a better education to your children, they're gonna have a better future. They always retain this belief that, you know, if you invest in the next generation, tomorrow will be better than yesterday. Until now, today with the pandemic, the possibility of another pandemic with the climate crisis accelerating, accelerating also inequalities widening, I don't think we retain that faith that tomorrow will be necessarily better than yesterday. So that creates a lot of anxiety. This is a moment of uncertainties. I think we have entered the age of anger and fear and pessimism, the age of pessimism. So there are lots of negative emotions that we each and every one of us have to deal with. And we don't quite know how. To me, it feels better to be able to talk about these negative emotions rather than pretending they do not exist or trying to sweep them under the carpet. And then once we recognize their existence, see them as a source of energy. Anger is a source of energy. And actually, if we can turn anger into something better, more constructive and, and positive, both for ourselves and our communities, 
then you know then that's that's a good way forward rather than suppressing it so all i'm trying to say is it's understandable to feel frustrated disappointed bewildered confused angry and in fact if from time to time we don't find ourselves struggling with such emotions maybe we're not really following what's happening in the world when we do follow of course it affects us but then let's talk let's talk about the emotions that we're struggling with so that first of all we can understand we're not alone second of all we can understand there is a way there can be ways to turn them into something more positive you you talk in the book quite a lot about how it's not just you know cultural history that that and people's you know shared collective memory that bears the scars of the past, but also natural history too. You know ecosystems are affected. You mentioned that earlier, um, and you, you know it's told from the, the perspective of, of a fig tree. What what made you want to make um, that such a big focus? I think this is a moment of reckoning. It's a moment when we need to rethink what are my priorities in life, what are my values. Again, both individually and collectively, what do we want? Do we want more money, more profit, more greed, more corporate greed? You know, this even when there's, let's say, no greed on a personal basis, constant rush. We're always hurrying from one appointment to the next. And it, it always feels like we're lagging behind. You know, time is flying. We're not fast enough. You have to speed up information you need to consume as fast as you can is that the direction that we want to go or or do we is this a moment when we need to stop and restructure almost everything and be aware of inequalities and what is you know accumulated pain and try to build something better and maybe realize the pandemic also helped us to realize it's actually those immaterial things in life like family or love or friendship or sisterhood, the things that you can't turn into numbers, those are the things that kept us going. And connecting with nature is a big, big part of that. Just the luxury of sitting under a tree, you know, reading a book, we miss that. We learn not to take that for granted. So it is a crucial moment for us, I think, to reconnect with nature and also to realize that we're not the center of earth, you know, we're not the owners of this planet. We're just part of an ecosystem. And trees are actually wiser than us. They have lived longer than us. They were here before us and they will still be here when we have all disappeared. So we have to be a little bit more humble and understand what we don't know. That's the thing. I think we forgot to say, I don't know. Uh, you know, when was the last time we ever said, I don't know. If I don't know a, a topic, I can just Google it. In the next five minutes, I can say something. That doesn't mean I have knowledge about the subject. So that kind of humility that we have lost and realization that we're all part of an ecosystem, in fact, not above it, is something that we urgently need to embrace, especially as the climate crisis is clearly unfolding in front of our eyes. And you're right, um, uh, you know, the importance of connecting, reconnecting with, with nature, I think, for a lot of people has suddenly become much more important. Um, what you also do really brilliantly is is use nature and food, for example, to reconnect with a different culture. Um, it, it sort of helps people join a cultural memory. You know, it, it helps Ada sort of understand more about um, Cyprus. Is, is that something that's always sort of been an important trigger for you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I always think food is more than food, isn't it? Uh, also, maybe because I was raised by a grandmother who was a bit like Auntie Mariam in the book. My grandmother also, you know, was full of stories and proverbs and this oral culture. Uh, and I, I respect that world. I, am, I, I feel connected to that world. I've never looked down upon that world. Sometimes in Turkey, writers or intellectuals can belittle oral culture, thinking it's just full of irrationality or, you know, women's... There's, yeah, there's a condescending attitude towards oral culture. I've always had an issue with that. And I would love my writing as best as I can to bridge written culture and oral culture. And I also think in, in the Middle East, especially we have this baklava wars, for instance, you know, the Lebanese say it's our baklava, we make the best baklava. The Syrians say, no way, it's ours. We Turks like to think we make the best baklava in the world and the Greeks say it's theirs. But of course, the beauty of baklava, the beauty of food, is that it's nobody's baklava. It's everyone's. 
So there's something about food that really transcends all kinds of ethnic, religious, nationalistic boundaries. And I love that. I love tracing that. So the history of food or the rituals of cooking, these are things that really speak to me. And, and I'm always interested in the things that can travel across borders, whether it's superstitions or stories or food. You know, what are the things that connect us, not divide us? I, yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm convinced it's going to be either Baklava or hummus yeah, the yeah. World, <laughs> that launches the next world, world war, probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, you mentioned earlier the Committee on Missing Persons, and that sort of becomes a, a big part, feature of the plot. And, you know, there is a, a, a sense, almost like Antigone, of, you know, if you've survived horrors of trying to help others who, who haven't been so lucky. I mean, tell us a bit about the committee and, and you know, what, what you got to know of, of their work and, and what, why it's sort of been such a, a source of interest for you. Yeah, I have so much respect for people who have worked uh, on this committee and so much is a, you know, maybe it's going to sound odd for me to say this, but really a labor of love or a labor of faith, maybe I should say, because they put so much work into it um, and and to, to create a better future, but to also honor people's memories and people's sorrows. And I have read and I have listened to incredibly moving personal stories, some of which are in the book. I've also mentioned a couple of books at the end uh, for anyone who's interested in reading. But of course, it's not only in Cyprus, as we said, in South America, for instance, um, there's a big literature there in Chile, in Argentina, in Bolivia, Spain after the Civil War. There's a huge literature there. Uh, incredible stories. So I've also been reading about that and learning a lot. Iraq recently, Bosnia after the genocide. There are so many people who have had to dig in order to find the bones of the missing. It's, a, it's such a, a traumatic fact for so many people. Um, we've got a number of questions coming in from the audience, and I'm aware that we're running out of time, so I want to try to attack as many as possible. Um, we've got a delightful one here from Mohammed who asks, can you share one of your favorite memories with your grandma? Oh, wow. <laughs> I mean, there's so many because um, this is the woman who raised me. I was born in France. Uh, my parents got separated. My father stayed in France and my mother brought me to Turkey. For her, it was motherland. For me, it was a completely new country to discover. And because she was a young divorcee without a diploma, um, my grandmother encouraged her actually to go back to university. So in a way, off my mother went and I was raised by my grandmother until the age of 10. So we were incredibly close. And this is a woman who would interpret dreams, for instance. She was a bit of a storyteller. Uh, she was a bit of a healer in her own way. People would come to her complaining about, you know, <laughs> skin diseases. I know all of that sounds very irrational, but her house was full of magic. So coffee cup readings, uh, melting lead to, to ward off the evil eye. Like at night, if you wake up, you're not supposed to step on certain places because there might be a gin sleeping there. You know, all of these stories, I grew up with them. So there's a part of me that remembers all of that very vividly. But I need to add very quickly, it wasn't a world full of fear because it, can, it could have been like that. Hers was more compassionate. She was a woman who was very, very compassionate and there was a lot of love in her heart. And that's the best thing that stayed with me. A, a, it sounds a lot like your writing. Um, we've got another question here, which asks, um, it says, I really like the way you wrote from the perspective of a fig tree. Does the fig tree have special meaning to you? Oh, <laughs> I think it does. And, you know, as I was writing this book, I learned so much because there's, there's a lot of research that goes into a novel. So I've been reading about trees in general. And the more you read, the more you respect them and realize how sentient they are and how much there is we still don't know about trees, even though there's a remarkable literature out there, especially in the last decades, there's still a lot that needs to be discovered. And then when you read about fig trees, it's really remarkable because fig trees sustain an entire ecosystem the whole year round. So when you kill a fig tree, you're affecting the lives of you know, other plants and bats and, and birds, many, many 
other beings feed on figs. Feeds are uh, fig trees are remarkable. Also in history, uh, maybe in a more spiritual way, in religious texts, it's just mesmerizing. There's a whole literature out there. And I came to respect fig trees more and more, the more I read about them. I love the bit where uh, the fig tree insists that the, in the Garden of Eden, it was actually yeah. a fig tree rather than an apple tree. Yes, <laughs> and it was a, it was a mistranslation. And actually, there's a strong argument in the literature that, that you know, confirms, yeah, that, that confirms that it was a <laughs> mistranslation because it doesn't make <laughs> sense that they ate the apple, but they covered themselves with the leaves of a fig tree. There's, there's something there. <laughs> That's so true. Um, we've got a question here, uh, another one saying, the theme of climate change came across very strongly. Is Costas's grief at the birds dying representative of ecological grief? Yes, I really appreciate this question. And also, you know, thinking about Costas' personality, it, it, was, it was very moving for me. When you come from complex places that have experienced a lot of sorrow and hurt and violence, if you talk about trees and plants and animals, sometimes it can sound like a luxury, you know, because, because so much is happening, people don't have the time or the energy to focus on trees, let's say. But Costas doesn't think that way. For him, everything is related, everything is connected. So he, of course he cares about human suffering, but he also cares about the suffering of animals. He also cares about what's happening to trees and forests and plants. So that kind of holistic view of the world is something that we have forgotten. It's especially hard for people who come from places of ultranationalism or violence, but I think it's, it's incredibly important to remember that a more holistic view of the world is possible. So Costas is someone who's very much aware of ecological crisis and that we cannot solve the problems of our civilization without um, ecological awareness, you know, environmental awareness. Um, we've got a question from Michaela who says, the situation in Afghanistan now reminded me of the war in 1974. Yeah. Has anything changed? Yeah, yes. It's such a, I mean, the, the question is so powerful. And of course, on the one hand, unfortunately, not enough has changed and we see these repetitions. That's the thing, isn't it? We tend to believe that history is linear, progressive, that it, that it has to go forward always. There's a passage in the book in which the fig tree compares human time with tree time and talks about how tree time is actually more cyclical, more perennial you know, and, and more aware of patterns. So when we look at history from that perspective, sometimes it feels like we are making the same mistakes or repeating the errors that our great grandparents have made. I'm not denying that there has been progress, but it's heartbreaking that in the year 2021, we see women and minorities, because it's always women and minorities that are regarded as casualties. You know, when big changes happen, they are not as important. Women and what will happen to women, what will happen to youth, what will happen to minorities, sexual minorities, for instance, they're almost never mentioned. And I hate that. You know, I hate that thing of real politic. You have to focus on other things, but not human lives. I, I've never understood that. So women and minorities are not casualties, and we have to care about each other's stories, we also need to stop seeing this as a problem that only happens miles away, continents away. I think we need to understand whether it's women's rights or human rights, it can be taken away so easily. It mm. can even happen here, anywhere. So democracy is not that solid. We all need to put effort into it. It's a very delicate ecosystem itself. And in that regard, I think this is a crucial moment when we need more global sisterhood more awareness and more connectivity. We've got a question from Jane who asks, how have Cypriots responded to your story? And has there been a difference between the Greek Cypriot and the Turkish Cypriot response? Actually, there hasn't been any difference in, in terms of ethnic or you know, um, lines. And I have received incredibly moving letters, emails, um, shares on social media, 
people who have come to my book festivals and really some very heartwarming moments that I will never ever forget. But if I may share one of them at the FT festival, this happened, a young Cypriot came and she has parents who come from different backgrounds. And she was tearful, you know, when she was talking about the book. So I will never ever forget this. Of course, you can never please ultranationalists on both sides. They will always be upset because they would want to prioritize their own angle. But I, uh, that's, that's not the angle that I want to, you know, that's, that's not the, how I see the world. So I'm not talking about the ultranationalistic perspective, but other than that, I've received really very heartwarming feedback from, from the islanders, and that means a lot to me. That really is lovely. Um, we've got a question here from somebody who sort of says there are a lot of girls, um, potential Elif Shafaks with great skills, but who are living in an, a relatively oppressive atmosphere in Turkey now, who may not feel that they can write whatever they want to. What, what would you advise them? Yeah, I am I'm, I'm very well aware of, of the fact that we don't allow our girls, particularly, to express themselves, you know, to follow their own dreams, their own heart. And if I may share this quickly, I used to go to many schools in Turkey to give talks on different festivals. I've never forgotten, if you speak to a seven-year-old, eight-year-old child in Turkey, it's really amazing to see how much courage they have, how much chutzpah and confidence. And usually at that age, girls are just as confident, if not even more confident, self-confident than, than boys, right? But then... I would go and speak to 14 year olds, 15, 16 year olds. So teenagers who have gone through puberty and years of schooling and everything has changed. And now you won't find many girls speaking up or putting their hands up. They have become timid. Why? Because we taught them to blend in, you know, never to stand out, just be like everyone else. Be aware that you are being judged, how you dress up, the length of your skirt, you know, how you hold your body, what you say, whether you laugh out loudly, giggle, you know, all these stigmas, you will be judged. So little by little, we teach girls, especially girls, to lose that beautiful self-confidence that they naturally had when they were younger. And when they were younger, many of them actually wanted to be poets or artists or ballerinas or writers, you know. Again, we taught them that that's not possible, that there's a certain path that they need to follow, otherwise they'll be judged. So this is what we keep doing to our girls, boys as well, but especially girls. And I think we need to change this. We need to create an atmosphere where every girl, every human being feels welcome, but we need feminism for that. We need feminist awareness for that. Was it hard for you when you first started? Uh, or was it something that you felt compelled to do? It was it was hard. It's still hard, you know. I think um, in Turkey, being a writer is a heavy thing. And if you're a women writer, a women novelist, it's even heavier. You need to deal with an additional layer of sexism and misogyny. And the literary world, at first glance, might look more modern, whatever that means. But when you scratch the surface, it's the same old patriarchy everywhere. So the way a woman poet or a writer or an artist is treated will never be the same. The way you will be reviewed will never be the same compared to a male artist. Because patriarchal societies, we are matriarchal in the house, in the house, in our private space, which means we respect our grandmothers, which means until a woman is regarded as old in the eyes of the society, she won't be respected you will always be regarded as women first. You know, a male novelist is a novelist. A woman novelist is a woman first. So you're completely treated through a different lens, a different filter. We respect our grandmothers because they're defeminized. They're desexualized in our eyes. They're not women anymore. And we need to unpack those layers of, uh, you know, discrimination. And I think it's, it's hard. Um, when when you're a female artist or a writer but at the same time these are countries where books matter stories matter and if a reader likes a book they pass it on they share it you know on average a book is read by five to six people 
And that word of mouth, that beautiful energy that comes from readers is, is really precious for me. I'm also aware of that. We've got a question here, um, which asks, do you think exiles who return can be fully accepted by those who've remained? Um, as Daphne talk, you know, says in the book, those who leave cannot. What a great, what an intelligent question. I don't know the answer, you know, but it's a question that I do think about a lot. And as you um, alluded, alluded to in, in, in the book, there's this dilemma between Costas and Daphne. Uh, one, of, one of them has left, the other one has stayed behind. And there's a moment when Costas says, those who stay behind, they are the ones who deal with the wounds and the scars. And that's not easy, of course, it's very painful. But those of us who left, maybe our wounds are always open and it never heals. So being an immigrant, being an exile, being abroad, but still carrying another place in your soul, there's a certain melancholy to it. I am very much aware of that. At the same time, there's a richness to it because you learn from multiple cultures. I honestly believe that I have multiple belongings. We all have multiple belongings. So you can have you know, this sense of attachment to another place as well, just as strongly. However, what you have left behind will always come with you. It will follow you, like in the poem of Kavafi. So that sense of absence, that sense of melancholy is something I believe immigrants and exiles will always carry. Um, we are running out of time, but I want to very quickly just get a couple more questions in. Um, one which I think will help us all um, is from Susan and she asks, what brings you hope? Beautiful. Um, you know, I'm, I jokingly think sometimes, I can't be very optimistic, I'm Turkish, you know, it's not in my DNA. <laughs> but I have a positive view on pessimism. If it's healthy dose of pessimism, actually, it's okay for the mind to be a bit more pessimistic. Um, but the heart, the human soul has to remain more hopeful, of course. And the hope that we long for will come to us from our fellow human beings when we learn each other's stories. The very fact that, you know, here we are, we come from different backgrounds and yet we connect. Even at the time of pandemic, despite the obstacles, we still connect. And there's this human connection. So whatever we call that thing, whether it's love or sisterhood, humanism, I don't know what that is, but it's stronger than hatred and it keeps coming with us. So that gives me hope and we should never lose sight of that. We've got some great questions here. I'm really sorry we're running out of time for them all, but um, I, the last one I just felt I had to ask you because for all the aspiring writers who want to know what influences you out there, um, we've got a question here sort of saying, um, could you talk us through, from Wendy saying, could you talk us through some of your favorite books on the shelves behind you? Oh. <laughs> we can get a sense of what, what, um, what shapes your thinking. You know, it's um, rather than one book or one genre, I think what nourishes my mind best is to read across the board. Uh, so both fiction and nonfiction. And to be honest, when sometimes readers come to me, and usually it's male readers who do this, they say, so much is happening in the world. I read technology, I read about finance or history, politics, but I don't have time for fiction. My wife reads fiction, you know, my girlfriend reads fiction. I feel very sad when I hear this. I think inside fiction, there is politics. There is technology, neuroscience, psychology, philosophy, history, and so much more. But most importantly, there's emotional intelligence. And I don't know a single human being who doesn't need emotional intelligence. So all I'm trying to say is I think it's better if we read both fiction and nonfiction, try to keep our reading lists eclectic and make sure that we read all the time. You know, rather than what we read, just the sheer act of reading itself, you know, making reading constant, continuous, is um, what teaches me most and, and what I appreciate, yeah. I am so sorry we've run out of time. Um, <laughs> it's been so, so fast. Many, so many <laughs> questions we still, we still had coming in. So thank you to everyone who sent them in. I'm so sorry if we didn't get through them all. Um, I'm, I'm so sorry we ran out of time, but. Thank you so much, Elif, for, for, for joining us tonight. Um, and just a quick reminder that you can pick up the book at, uh, on the Hay Festival website or at all good um, bookshops. Um, the Hay Book of the Month for October is online now and registrations are open for the event. And if you're interested in the Hay Festival Winter Weekend programme, that's also online. So do have a look. Um, thanks again to everyone who joined us tonight. 
Good night. Good night. I'm so grateful. Thank you.